In episode one of Truth Be Told, we get introduced to Poppy Parnell, who is a true crime journalist who really made a career on a kid named Warren Cave. Warren was charged with killing his neighbor, Chuck Berman, who was a writer with a wife and two twin girls. On the outside, it seemed like it was the perfect life. And what the police will tell you happened that night is that Chuck was up late answering emails when he heard somebody come to the door. And when he went to investigate it, that person bludgeoned him to death. The police believe that Warren Cave was that person, and Chuck's body wasn't found until the next morning by his wife because his wife and his children, who were sleeping at the time, never woke up during the attack. Now, a lot of the evidence that they had was circumstantial. They didn't even have a witness. They also didn't have any of Warren's DNA on Chuck's body, and they didn't recover a murder weapon. But what they did have was Warren's fingerprints near the body, and the testimony from Chuck's 15-year-old daughter, Lainey, who testified that she actually did wake up, and when she looked out her window, she saw Warren jumping the fence. So all of that, along with Poppy's articles from the San Francisco Chronicle, portraying Warren, who was 17 at the time, as this monster, sealed Warren's fate. But that was back in 2005, and present day, the defense has found some new testimony, so they try to get an appeal. And the new testimony is video of Lainey six months before testifying in front of a jury, and it's clear that she was coached. But even with this evidence, the judge refuses the appeal. And Poppy had gone to the appeal that day, and when she sees the video and sees Lainey's demeanor, she is convinced that she was lying. She starts feeling really guilty that she might have had a massive part of sending this guy to prison for life when he might be innocent. And this guilt is getting at her so much that she starts combing through the evidence and decides to do a podcast series about the case again. But after doing the first episode and talking with her podcast partner, Noah, they realize that they're going to need Warren's story with this. They need to hear from him. But Poppy's pretty conflicted about what to do, so she goes to her sister Desiree to get some advice. And Desiree shoots her straight, saying that if she had anything to do with putting this guy in prison for life and he was innocent, she needs to do something to get him out. So that's just the push that Poppy needed. She goes to visit Warren's mother, Melanie, and catches Melanie taking out the trash. And Melanie is not too pleased to see Poppy as you can imagine. In fact, as soon as she sees Poppy, she ends up dropping the trash all over the ground, just in frustration. Poppy isn't deterred, though, and tells Melanie that she's coming in peace. She wants to interview Warren, and she needs Melanie's help to do so because Warren isn't exactly receptive to her requests. But Melanie isn't too motivated to help out Poppy because she feels like Poppy portrayed her son out to be this monster that he's not. But then Poppy asks, how long? And Melanie says, what are you talking about? And Poppy picks up some of the trash and says, how long have you had breast cancer? Because my mother had this exact same diet. And Melanie admits that she was diagnosed with six months to live four months ago. So time's running out. So Poppy says, let me help you. But Melanie says, no, you're a horrible woman. Stop trying to use my family's grief and sends her packing. Poppy then gets in the car and calls up Noah to let her know that it's a no-go. But she also had Noah digging in on the other side of this case, the Bermans. And Noah says that she found nothing on Aaron or Josie, but Lainey is working as a death doula, which is ironic. Somebody whose father was murdered is teaching others how to die. And boy, is she good at her job. She helps this one family's matriarch die and then heads off and has sex with what looks like the grandson. Because it turns out what Chaz from Wedding Crasher said was correct. Grief is nature's most powerful aphrodisiac. Look it up. The only hiccup is Lainey's actually married with kids, and when she arrives home that day from work, she's greeted by Poppy, who introduces herself and tells her she wants to interview her about the Warren Cave case, but Lainey tells her to get lost, and that's when her family comes out. Poor husband has no idea that his wife was just banging some random guy in the back of a station wagon. But this encounter with Poppy actually sticks with Lainey. And that night, she heads to her Aunt Susan's place and explains the exchange with Poppy. And her aunt says, well, what did you tell her? And Lainey says, I told her nothing because we shouldn't be telling her anything. But I need to warn my sister. I need to warn Josie. I know Josie wants to be left alone, but that's why I need to talk to her. I mean, what happens if this woman ends up finding Josie? Her aunt sits her down and says, look, if it's an emergency, I can get in touch with your sister. But don't let this woman upend all the hard work you've done. You've come too far. But back with Poppy, after getting a no from Melanie and a no from Lainey, it seemed like Poppy kind of hit a dead end. So she heads to church that day with her family. But as she's exiting, she gets a phone call from Melanie saying, all right, I don't trust you, but I've gotten you in to see Warren. The only stipulation is... You do not, under any circumstance, tell him that I'm sick. And Poppy agrees to those stipulations, so she goes up to meet with Warren at San Quentin, and Warren has the same reservations that his mother did. He starts to try to intimidate Poppy a little bit, and goes so far as to show her his Nazi tattoos slash Aryan Brotherhood tattoos, and that actually works. She ends up yelling guard and leaving, but as soon as she gets in her car, she's mad at herself for letting this guy win. 
She then heads to visit with Melanie, who's going through chemo, and says, you didn't tell me that your son was a Nazi. And Melanie says, does it even really matter? I mean, that storyline sells itself. A woman so noble, she overlooked the faults of an enemy to prove his innocence? Poppy, though, is still pretty skeptical, and Melanie says, whatever you saw in there is not my son. It's what prison made my son into. You have to remember, my son went in there when he was 17 years old. If he never went in there, he never would have ended up a Nazi. The fact is, there is a monster in every single one of us, and for Warren, it was unleashed in San Quentin. For me, it was unleashed when I started smoking. But what about you, Poppy? Was it your monster who made you disregard an innocent boy for all these years? And then have the audacity to come here and judge the man who he became in that prison? She gets close to Poppy and says, help me get my son out of prison so I can see him again on the outside before I die. So with that in mind, Poppy heads back to the bar that her sister works at, although this time it's for a birthday party for her father. But before the party kicks off, she needs more advice from her sister, but it's more of that advice that you want to be reassured of what you're doing is the correct thing, and her sister doesn't give that to her. Desiree tells her, yeah, things change when we're talking about a Nazi. If you want to help somebody, go help your cousin that you never visit. But Poppy's guilt is getting to her. She still wants to help Warren. She just wanted to be reassured that that was the right thing to do. Desiree is not giving that to her. And this argument ends up getting broken up by Lillian, who's their stepmother. And they're not a big fan of Lillian because Lillian is about the same age as them. She pulls Poppy to the side, though, and shows Poppy the gift that she ended up getting for Poppy's father for his birthday, and it's a bike with her picture on it. And Poppy's not a fan of it, and Lillian can clearly tell. But everybody goes in the bar and starts having a good time at the party. But as Poppy's waiting at the bar for a drink, her ex, Marcus, shows up. And that relationship didn't end well, because Marcus cheated on her, and she ended up fleeing taking a job with the New York Times that she didn't even really want. Her family looked at it like she was fleeing from having to deal with them. But Poppy's since married, and Marcus is since married and divorced. Either way, though, the two start kind of flirting at the bar with each other, but he does tell her that even though he's no longer working for the Oakland Police Department, he still does a little investigation on the side, because Poppy's younger sister told Marcus that she was looking into this old case. So Marcus says, if you need help, just ask. Well, Poppy says, nah, I'm good. And he says, you're sure? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty good. And in comes Poppy's husband, Ingram, who has heard his wife tell this guy that she's good. So he kind of steps to Marcus a little bit, introducing himself as Poppy's husband. And Marcus has introduced himself as Poppy's roadkill. At this point, though, everybody kind of goes their separate ways. But later on in the party, Poppy goes up to see her dad. But her dad starts kind of freaking out at her a little bit. It seems like her dad doesn't know who he's talking to. He's acting really weird. And the strangest part is Lillian is not surprised by it. And when they get home that night, she tells Ingram that she's concerned for her father because that wasn't like him at all. But Ingram says, let's just wait for everybody to sober up and then we'll find out what everybody knows. That night, though, she has a nightmare about Warren Cave and putting this innocent 17-year-old in jail. And she wakes up in the middle of the night and actually ends up waking up Ingram. And he asks her, what's wrong? And she says, I, I didn't do enough. And that's because Poppy got a tip that Lainey was coached. She never looked into it, which was her job. Instead, she just kept writing story after story because these stories were getting a lot of page views and upping her profile. But what she saw on that videotape was that tip confirmed. Lainey was coached. But instead of beating herself up about it, the next day she goes to visit Warren again, telling him, you know, I'm not believing this whole Aryan Brotherhood bullshit. A scared 17-year-old kid who didn't have a friend in the world when he entered here? Yeah, your ass was probably traded for cigarettes, so you joined this little cult to protect yourself. It's adorable, but I'm not buying it. So if you're tired of that lifestyle, we can get to work. But Warren doesn't say anything, just smirking at her. And that's when Poppy breaks a promise, telling Warren his mother is dying. And that definitely piques his interest, so he gets close and says, oh yeah, well, what's wrong with her? But Poppy doesn't answer, saying, tell me about the Bermans. And he slams the table in anger, and Poppy says, you can get mad at me all you want, but the reality is she's not going to tell you and she might never come back. So if you want a prayer of getting out of here to see your mother before she dies, I'm it. So tell me, why were your prints found in that house? And Warren goes on to explain how, while everybody thought that Aaron Berman had the perfect life, everybody also knew that she was a pill head. So he would break into their house to steal the pills. His prints were all over the house because he was trying to get drugs. Poppy asks him if he did that the night that Chuck was murdered, and he says no. But Poppy tells him, I've been a journalist for 20 years, and I can tell when someone's lying. And you're not telling the truth right now. She does, though, end up revealing to him the diagnosis of his mother. So Warren knows that if he wants to see his mother again, he's going to have to come clean and tell Poppy what happened. But Poppy warns him, if you try this racist bullshit with me, that's it. I'm done. 
and I'm going to make sure you die in this hellhole. So she sets up the tape recorder, and he starts telling his side of things. And to her credit, in the first episode, she leaves in the part of Warren telling the audience that Poppy portrayed him as this privileged, entitled psychopath. And Poppy admits that she helped seal Warren's fate with all the articles that she wrote. She finishes the podcast by saying, is there an innocent man in prison, and did I help put him there? In the second episode, Warren's pretty upset that his mom didn't tell him that she was sick. So he calls her up and confronts her about it, but says, all right, what kind of cancer? How long did they give you? And she says, "Ah, don't even worry about that. He's getting pressured to hang up because his time's up. And when he does so, the inmate who takes the phone from him says, nobody gives a fuck that your mom has cancer. And that's when Warren beats the ever-loving shit out of him. Now, on the outside, Poppy and Ingram are going for a walk in their neighborhood as Poppy tells Ingram that she'll help him with this dinner party, but in return, she doesn't want to hang out with his mom. That's when the two get pulled over, though, by a police officer. But it's not just any police officer, it's Owen Cave, Warren's father. And he's come because he wants Poppy to stop doing the podcast. He tells her, I listened to what you put out, I just don't understand why you'd want to open that wound up again. But Poppy says, it's because I believe your son's innocent. And Owen kind of shakes his head and says, for years, I thought the same thing, that there was some missing clue out there. But eventually, you just got to accept the fact that it isn't, and he's guilty. He begs her to stop doing the podcast, but she says, I can't do that. I mean, what if I'm right? What if you made a mistake? And Owen looks at her and says, my son deserves to be in prison. You'll look at the evidence, and you'll come to the same conclusion, because it's the truth. And then he leaves. And the fact that Owen doesn't want Poppy digging further into the case makes Poppy want to dig further into the case. She heads to her podcast office with Noah, where Noah lets her know that Lainey has threatened a restraining order if they continue to contact her. Poppy tells her she plans to have Marcus look around on the case, and that is surprising to Noah because Noah was around 20 years ago when Poppy and Marcus broke up the first time, and it wasn't a pretty sight. She's concerned that the guy that made Poppy's knees weak is back in the picture, but Poppy reassures her, That was a long time ago. We're just working together. Don't sweat it. Poppy then starts putting pictures up of the people involved, Owen, Lainey. But then one of the pictures she puts up is of their Aunt Susan. Poppy mentions the fact that she was at the trial every single day, and she seemed really close to the twins. And that's when Noah points out that Josie never actually gave a statement. Aaron said that she would be too weak, and the police said they had enough information anyway, so she wasn't even needed. So all of this is a good starting off point, and once Noah leaves... Poppy calls up Marcus and asks him if Marcus is familiar with Owen Cave. And he says, yeah, the chief of police for Menlo Park. Poppy mentions how Owen wanted her to back off the case and she wants to know why. He agrees to it, but in a very, very flirtatious way. He asks, do you need anything else? And Poppy says, yeah, actually, I've been trying to reach Susan or Lainey. Neither are getting back to me and I need one of them to lead me to Josie because Josie's been missing since she graduated high school. So Marcus heads off to dig in for Poppy. But Lainey went to go meet with Melanie. She felt like Melanie was the one that pointed Poppy in her direction in the first place. The two end up trading insults back and forth with Lainey saying, do you really think all the secrets came out in that trial? And Melanie says, do you really think threatening me is going to work? Because it's not. This whole intimidation tactic. And Lainey, while she's walking away, says, yeah, it's really cute that you believe that. And takes off. She then goes to her Aunt Susan's place. And unbeknownst to the both of them, Marcus is there waiting for them. And when Susan and Lainey leave in the car, Marcus tails them. And while Susan's driving, Lainey brings up her sister because she's really concerned with the fact that Poppy can find her. But Susan reassures her there's no way Poppy could ever locate Josie. And it becomes clear that Lainey really has no idea where her sister is. And she's getting more and more upset that Susan won't tell her. And then suddenly the phone rings and Lainey says, is that her? Meaning Josie. And the two end up fighting for the cell phone while Susan's driving and getting into an accident. And it's a really serious accident. One where Susan ends up dying and Lainey ends up going to the hospital. Now while this was going on, Poppy had no idea about it because she was spending the day with her sisters. Her sisters had pointed out that maybe Josie wants to be left alone because she doesn't want to be bothered about the worst day of her life. But eventually, Poppy turns the conversation to their dad. And that's when both of Poppy's sisters get real quiet. They're not really willing to talk about the situation. Actually going so far as to leave. And part of the reason why they don't want to open up to Poppy about it is because she just got back to the Bay Area six months ago. But after they leave, that's when Poppy gets a phone call from Marcus alerting her to the severity of the crash. And Marcus wants to meet up with her because Marcus took Susan's cell phone from the scene of the accident. Poppy's kind of mortified at this behavior and asks him, is the kind of behavior that got you kicked off the force? But Marcus takes that as an insult, saying, do you want the damn thing or don't you? Because I really thought this was a by any means necessary situation. Marcus gets up and leaves the phone on the bench next to Poppy and says, there's no passcode. That should be enough information in there to help you with your podcast. But I'm telling you right now, you better be right about Warren Cave. So Poppy ends up taking it back to her podcast office. And along with Noah, they start looking through the phone and realize that Josie has changed her hair, moved to New York, 
is getting married and has changed her name to Vivian Parr. Now, what they don't know is the fact that she's adopted a British accent. She's portraying herself as a British immigrant who is having visa issues. And we don't know if the guy that she's marrying knows any of this, but it's worth mentioning that the guy that she's marrying has a kid from a previous relationship with his old wife who ended up dying six months after their son was born. So Josie slash Vivian is really the only mother that his son has ever known. Josie has literally gotten up, moved across the country, and adopted an entirely different life. So now that she has her phone number, Poppy calls her up and leaves a voicemail saying that she wants to interview her and sending her audio of her latest episode. And in the episode, she points out that usually the police in this type of murder will look at the family. But in this case, they never did that. They never questioned the daughters. And it's really weird how Josie has just vanished out of thin air. But Josie doesn't call Poppy back, so Poppy books a flight to New York. And as she's about to walk out the door, she mentions to Ingram that she's going to go there and track down Josie until she talks. But that's a little bit of a point of contention with Ingram because he had that dinner party planned. And Poppy says just, you know, reschedule it, but he doesn't want to. He says he can't. He gets really angry, saying, you can't just put our lives on hold to go chase a ghost. But hey, the ticket's booked, and she's gonna go, so she leaves. And after arriving in New York, it doesn't take long to find Josie. She tries to confront her, but Josie flees into the subway. Although, she doesn't do a great job of it, Poppy follows her, and eventually Josie just gives in and goes to get coffee with her. And the first thing that Poppy tells her is that her Aunt Susan died. And it's not like Lainey didn't want to tell her. Lainey did. She looked all over her Aunt Susan's house for any contact information for Josie to tell her that Susan died, but she wasn't able to find it. So unfortunately for Josie, she had to find out from Poppy. Poppy then moves into the Warren Cave situation and tells Josie she's pretty sure Warren is innocent and Lainey was lying when she said that she saw Warren that night. She asks Josie if there's anything that she can remember from that night, but Josie looks at her and says, this isn't a story to me, it's my life. Or it was. I've moved on and you're trying to destroy that. Josie then gets up to leave, but Poppy pulls out her Aunt Susan's cell phone and gives it to her, saying, I found it near the scene, I kept it for you, I thought you'd want it. So Josie leaves that night and goes home with a cell phone with a rush of emotions knowing that her aunt is dead. And she actually ends up calling up Lainey. And this is the first time the two have talked in years. And Lainey begs Josie to come home. And Josie admits that she misses her sister a lot. But Josie tells Lainey, I'm never coming home because you terrify me. And then she hangs up. Now, somebody who is heading home is Poppy. And as she's heading to the airport, she gets a phone call from Marcus letting her know that after he did some digging, he found out that Melanie Kay was having an affair with Chuck Berman. And that changes the game. Because if Owen found out about it, that gives him motive. That could be the entire reason why he didn't want her digging into this case. That also must have been what the secret was that Josie was referring to when she confronted Melanie earlier. And Owen tried to attack this problem at both ends. He headed to San Quentin to visit Warren, and it's the first time he's visited him in quite a while. And he tells him, you can't talk to Poppy anymore. But Warren and Owen don't have the best relationship after Owen testified in the stand in favor of the prosecution. So as you can imagine, Warren isn't too keen to listen to his dad. But Owen threatens him, saying, I can make your life a living hell in here. But that intimidation doesn't work on Warren. He looks at his dad and says, or I could kill you. I mean, they got rid of the gas chamber in here, so life in prison, it's just days. He ends up yelling at his dad, I'll become the thing that you think I am. Because at the end of the day, you know that I'm innocent. But Owen isn't the only one that doesn't want Warren speaking to Poppy. Because at dinner that night, the Aryan Brotherhood comes up to him and says, Hey, who is that black woman you were talking to? And Warren says, Oh, she's a reporter looking into my case. And the leader says, That it? And Warren says, Yeah, that's it. But whether it's the Aryan Brotherhood or Owen Cave's guys on the inside, later that day, somebody comes up behind Warren and shanks him a few times. And Warren is on the ground of the prison, bleeding out, as everybody else is distracted by a prison fight. In episode three, the good news is we learn that Warren did survive the attack. And as he's lying in the infirmary, a correctional officer comes up and says, I'm required to let you know that we can put you in protective custody. But Warren isn't about that life. He demands to be put in Gen Pop. The CEO kind of chuckles and says, dude, you're not going to last a day. That little podcast has made you a celebrity. But Warren is adamant to be released back into Gen Pop. Now, on the outside, Poppy goes to visit Warren but finds out that her visitation rights have been taken away. And the correctional officer in charge of the visitation isn't exactly helping Poppy out. In fact, she's being quite rude. Not giving her a lot of answers, but she does let her know that Warren got shanked. So after being denied access to Warren, she heads to Ingram because Ingram's a lawyer. And she explains that she was just stonewalled at San Quentin and she needs legal advice on how to get back in. But once Ingram finds out that Warren got shanked, his mood changes. And when Poppy asks, do I have any legal recourse here? Ingram just says, no, you don't. But one of Ingram's associates says, well, if Warren's attorney, who, by the way, doesn't exist, he doesn't have one, but if Warren's attorney designates Poppy as an investigator for 
the defense, that would get her back in. Although this poor girl realizes that she made a colossal mistake when she sees Ingram's face and realizes, oh, he didn't actually want her back in. When Poppy says, would that work? Ingram just says, we'll take a look at it. And at this point, Poppy is aware that Ingram doesn't want her to go back to San Quentin. Poppy then heads to Noah's and is explaining how frustrating the day has been. She tells Noah, I'm pretty sure that Owen Cave took away my clearance. Poppy also knows that the walls in San Quentin don't keep much out. So when Noah says, would your father help you with this? Initially, Poppy says, no, he wouldn't. But then she remembers somebody that her father used to ride bikes with back in the day who might be able to. So that night, Poppy heads to this guy's bar, a guy named Jerbic. And this isn't the type of bar that you want to be entering, especially as a black female. And when Marcus finds out that she's headed there alone, he calls up getting concerned, but she just hangs up on him. And when she walks in, it's like the scene from Animal House where the music stops and everyone stares at her. And and eventually somebody approaches her wanting to know what she's doing there and she asks for Jerbic saying, I'm Shreve's daughter. Jerbic ends up overhearing this and is willing to take the meeting. And while it's true that Poppy's dad and Jerbic used to ride together, it becomes evident that that was a long time ago and their friendship deteriorated. So Poppy tries to bring up the good times when Jerbic got out of San Quentin and her dad was there to ride with him, along with a bunch of other people. And Poppy remembers it because she remembers Jerbic winking at her before he rode up to the front. That kind of changes Jerbic's mood a little bit, but he does ask, why didn't your dad facilitate this meeting? And Poppy explains that the guy that she wants to get in contact with on the inside is Aryan Brotherhood. She realizes how ridiculous that sounds, but explains that journalists will kind of do that sometimes and further explains that she's pretty sure Warren is innocent and she's a big part of why he's in there so Jerbic agrees and Poppy gets out of there safely and the next day when she goes to visit her dad at her dad's bar she gets a phone call from a block number and it's Warren Cave and she only has one question for him she sets up her recording device and says did you know that your mom was having an affair with Chuck Berman and he says yeah I did but not only did Warren know about it Warren saw it firsthand and he tells Poppy that he wasn't the only one who knew about it because Owen Cave knew about it after Warren told him. It turns out Owen knew for months before the murder. So with this new information, Poppy heads to Melanie's. She confronts her about the affair, and Melanie says, Owen had a rock salad alibi, if that's what you're getting at. And that is, in fact, what Poppy was getting at. In her latest episode, she kind of portrayed it as Owen was sacrificing his own son to save himself. Poppy asks, well, who else knew about the affair? And Melanie says Aaron had her suspicions, but she had her suspicions about any female that came around. And Aaron's alibi is more believable than anybody else's because her alibi is... She passed out drunk that night. So Poppy gets all of this on tape with an interview with Melanie. And afterwards, she calls up Marcus, who brings up the fact that Owen had a rock-solid alibi. He was on duty that night. But Poppy brings up the point that just because he was on duty that night doesn't mean he couldn't have done it. Marcus agrees to look into it, and he tracks down an old colleague who still works with Owen Cave. And he asks the guy for Owen Cave's call logs that night, but he says, I can't do that, man. Cave's the chief of police. When Marcus presses, the guy insults him and reminds Marcus that he's no longer a cop anymore, and he leaves. So Marcus is going to have to look somewhere else for the call logs. Now when Poppy got home that night, it's the first time she's seeing Ingram since he lied to her at his law firm. And they immediately start getting into it about why he lied. But their argument is broken up when they get a knock at the door and Poppy's dad, along with Lillian, walk through demanding to know why Poppy needed Jerbic's help. She explains how she needed to get to somebody on the inside, but he is really pissed off. He yells at her, you traded on my name. I don't like owing people shit. I haven't dealt with that guy in over a decade, but Poppy didn't know any of that. And Shreve says, of course you didn't, because this isn't your world anymore. He explains how Jerbic called him up, just happy as a clam, and said your daughter just cashed in one of your chips. Now, Ingram once again tries to be Tommy Tough Nuts, stepping up to probably a 70-year-old man. You know, those lawyers want all the smoke. But Shreve gives it right back to him. And Poppy has to get in the middle of the two and apologizes. And her dad says, why didn't you ask me? But before Poppy can even answer the question, he just shakes his head and says, AB, which everybody in the room knows stands for Aryan Brotherhood. He then tells her that she's stepping in shit that she has no business being around, and then he takes off. And after Shreve and Lillian left, Ingram is really nice. He gives Poppy a little bit of time before he goes back in resuming the argument that they had. Why Ingram lied in front of his coworkers, why she's pursuing this story, and they end up kind of agreeing to the fact that Poppy needs to keep her work out of the home life. Now later on that night, as Poppy continues to work on this case, she needs a call from Marcus, because Marcus's police friend thought better of it. He had listened to Poppy's podcast, and he didn't want to be on the wrong side of history, so he got the call logs, and they are very suspicious. Owen Cave had answered a domestic disturbance call. The call log has it marked down for about 75 minutes, which no domestic disturbance abuse takes 75 minutes, and it is at the exact time that Chuck Berman would have been killed. So the next day, armed with this new information, Poppy decides to pay Owen Cave a house call. And Owen is in his house with his new wife, his new son, 
and he is not too pleased to have Poppy knocking on his door. She plays in the audio of Warren saying that Owen knew about the affair. And after listening to it, Owen looks at her and says, what do you want? And she says, I want you on my podcast. You had motive, you had opportunity, and now I'm giving you the opportunity to set the record straight. Owen, though, yells at her, you can't play that and you can't use my name. But Poppy says, watch me. Owen stares her down and says, this is very dangerous for you. You cross the line and you pay, and that's a promise. And then he walks inside. And it wasn't like Owen was playing around because that night he sends a bunch of cops to Poppy's dad's bar and they walk in with a bunch of bullshit citations that are technically citations, but those kind of citations that no one ever checks on. And they also end up arresting Poppy's younger sister, Sidey, on parking tickets. And as they're taking her out to the car, the one commanding officer looks at Shreve and says, hey, where's your other daughter, the reporter? We were hoping she would be here. At Teller Owen Cave sends his love. The cops then take Sidey in a custody processor and the family doesn't call up Poppy but instead call up Ingram because he's the lawyer and Poppy and Ingram bail Sidey out. And when Sidey comes out, the family unleashes on Poppy. Her dad yells, you've been home for five minutes and they're raiding my bar, you're going to Jerbic, they're arresting your sister. What the hell did you do? But Poppy has no idea what he's talking about and he tells her, that cop cave did this. The one officer told me so. And he did this because of you. And as Poppy kind of tries to explain herself, Shreve ends up choking her, and that's when Ingram gets involved. Taking her away and yelling at the entire family, what the hell's wrong with you guys? And he drives Poppy home as Poppy is crying about the situation. Now, over with Lainey Berman, she had a home intrusion of her own. It was her mother. Aaron had found out that her sister died, so she decided to break into Lainey's house, and Lainey caught her. And it's the first time Lainey has seen Aaron since her daughter was born, and Aaron showed up drunk at the hospital. They don't have much of a relationship. And Lainey says, why did you come back? What do you want? And she came back because her sister died. But there was also the issue of the podcast. She found out about that. But the big one is the house. She tells Lainey, Susan took the house we grew up in. She took my family. She took my kids. She took my life. And I want it all back. So the next day, the two head to Susan's lawyer and are asking about how they go about selling the house. But Susan's lawyer says, you can't do that. Because the executor on Susan's will is Josie. And the two realize that this lawyer is in contact with Josie. Although when they ask him about it, he says he's not at liberty to say. So Lainey devises a plan. She waits out the lawyer in his lobby and gives him a present and says, please give this to Josie. It's not betraying attorney-client privileges. I just need this to get to her, please. And she begs him enough that he finally takes the package. But then she goes outside and tails his car to a hotel. And she follows the concierge up to a particular room where the concierge knocks, delivers the package, And at that point, Lainey knows what room Josie's in. So she also knocks. And when the door opens, she gives her sister a big hug. But her sister doesn't reciprocate. She pushes Lainey away and slams the door. And finally, with Warren Cave, he was released back to Gen Pop, where the celly next to him says, man, we never thought you'd be back. You're kind of a celebrity here. You are going to get back at those who got you, right? And Warren just kind of sighs and says, yeah, they'll get their show. In episode four, Lainey tracks down Josie at a local pool, and Josie is visibly annoyed. She feels like Lainey is stalking her. She has to remind her, I'm not here to see you. I'm here for the funeral of our aunt. And that's a sore subject for Lainey because she's annoyed that Susan made Josie the executor of the will when she was gone. She tells Josie, I think she did that so she would reassure that you had to come home at least once. The two start fighting with Josie trying to get away and Lainey grabbing at her and falling into the water where the two continue to fight. And while the two are fighting, Josie is having a flashback when they were teenagers and she woke up with Lainey trying to smother her with a pillow. And Susan had to literally pull Lainey off of her. Neither of them want to drown, so they get out. And Josie just says aloud, when we're done with this funeral, I'm gone for good. The next day, though, at the school that Susan works at, they were having a tree planting ceremony in her name. And Josie is there and up walks Lainey with her daughter. And once Josie sees her niece, she feels like she has to go over. She turns to Lainey and says, really, you brought your daughter? And Lainey says, whatever it takes. Lainey's daughter, who's probably five, notices that Josie looks exactly like her mom. And she introduces herself as Ella Josephine. And Josie looks up at Lainey like, really, you named your kid after me? Don't get too excited, though, Josie. It's a middle name. Once she straightens up, Lainey asks her, do you have any kids? Are you married? But Josie just says no. Josie starts having a flashback of when they were kids and Lainey beating the hell out of Warren. And she gets snapped out of it when Ella asks her, would you come over and have dinner at our house? So that night, Josie goes over and she's actually having a really nice time bonding with her sister, her brother-in-law, and her niece. And when Ella has to go to the bathroom and Lainey goes to help her, Alex, Josie's brother-in-law, says, you know, Lainey really missed you. But when Ella comes back in and tells Josie, I wish you were there when I was born, it's just a lot of emotion for Josie and she tries to get out of there. 
but Lainey goes after her. And Josie tells her sister, all I keep thinking about since I've arrived back here is you trying to smother me with a pillow and kill me. And Lainey immediately starts to try to apologize, saying, I know this makes no sense, but I was in a really weird state at that point. I was hurting all the time, and I needed you to feel the pain that I felt. I wasn't trying to kill you. I was trying to kill me. Which, yeah, by the way, makes no sense. Lainey says, don't worry, I'm in control of my life now. But Josie tells her, I think it's just best that once the funeral's over, we go our separate ways. We just enjoy the time we have together now. Alex walks in, though, and interrupts the conversation because he tells both of them that Aaron, their mother, has been arrested for breaking and entering. So Lainey makes her mom wait until the morning, going and bailing her out, and immediately the two start fighting. Aaron asks her, did you get in touch with Josie? And Lainey lies, saying, no, I didn't. Just putting her mom in a car and telling her, hey, pl- try not to get arrested before the funeral. And the next day is the day of the funeral. Lainey gets up there, gives a great eulogy, sits down in between Alex and Josie, and Josie turns to her and says, that was perfect. Lainey turns to her and says, I just want to let you know I'm really happy you're here, even if you don't stay. But then the church doors fly open and in walks a very drunk Aaron. Alex tries to get up and stop her, but she screams at him, no, I deserve to grieve too. And she gets up in front of everybody ready to give a eulogy, even after Josie tells her, you're just embarrassing yourself at this point. Aaron doesn't care though, because she's drunk. And she starts to go in on her sister, but that's when Josie stands up. And Josie wasn't planning on saying anything, but she feels like she needs to break up the extreme awkwardness in the room. So she walks up to the casket and starts singing a song. And once she's finished, she stands in the middle of the aisle, extends her hand to Lainey. Lainey comes out, and the two sisters walk out of the church hand in hand. Now over in San Quentin, Warren goes to that program that he gets to bond with the dog, and he walks up to the guy that was taking care of the dog that Warren's close with, Jack the dog, and he asks him, Do you know who did this to me? And the inmate says, no, but I'll keep my ears open for a price, though. It's hard to listen without being noticed. So Warren says, okay. But later in the day, as he's being escorted back to his cell by a CO, the CO tells him, actually, hold on a second. Just walk in this cell. And that's when the leader of the Aryan Brotherhood walks in. He found out that Warren was poking around who shanked him, and he is pissed off. He feels like Warren was totally out of line for doing that saying, you deserve answers, but you don't just start walking around demanding people start listening for you. And he makes it abundantly clear to Warren that he doesn't really care about Warren's safety. He cares more about his business. Because if Warren ends up getting retribution on this guy, then that could cause a lockdown, which locks down his business. He tells him, whoever did this will be dealt with, but you're to stand down. And that night, as Warren is eating with the rest of the Aryan Brotherhood, they're kind of giving him shit for the podcast. He gives it to him back. But then he notices the guy in the cell next to him gets up to clear his plate, so Warren gets up. And the celly next to him tells him, hey, the Mexicans were talking about you, and I took Spanish. I heard every word they were saying. And that's when he tells Warren that the guy who shanked him was the guy who was taking care of Jack the dog. So Warren waits until the next time that they have that program, and he asks the guy, hey, something's up with Jack. Come here. Let me show you. And when the guy gets low, Warren grabs him by the ball, saying, I know you did it. And the guy tells Warren that he was hired to do it by Owen Cave. Because this guy's girlfriend had gotten busted for possession and they were threatening to take his son away. And Owen made it all go away if he would shank Warren. So Warren lets him go, but he's in absolute disbelief that his father actually hired a fellow inmate to kill him. He then signals to Jack the dog to attack the guy, and Jack does. And as Warren eventually pulls the dog off, he mean mugs the shit out of this guy. And finally with Poppy. She goes to visit her uncle, who's on her mother's side, and he lives in a homeless shelter in San Francisco. She brings him some items, but asks him, do you want to go visit mom's grave? And he kind of chuckles to himself, saying, you always did this when you were a kid, too. Anytime you had problems with Shreve, you would go run to mom. And she can't believe that he's already heard about this. So he says, well, what are you going to do about it? And Poppy says, well, what is he going to do about it? And her uncle says, he's going to do nothing. Because when your dad looks at you, he just sees all the mistakes he made. Poppy doesn't really buy that, but her uncle reminds her that Shreve went to prison a week after Poppy's mom died, and he's always been beating himself up over that. It's food for thought for Poppy, but she gets back to the studio because she has to record her latest episode, where she gives out all the information she discovered on Owen Cave. The biggest being that there was a large gap in between the first domestic disturbance call and the second. And after recording the episode, she realized that she needs to find those two witnesses that called that night. She FaceTimes Marcus, and Marcus tells her, you know, this doesn't mean that Owen's guilty. I mean, cops do stuff on patrol all the time. But even Marcus knows it's kind of fishy. So she asks him, well, will you come with me to talk to some of these victims? It would help having a former cop there. Kind of give me a little credence. And Marcus says, yeah, I'll pick you up tonight. 
And as the two are heading over to talk to the one witness, Poppy gets a phone call from Desiree, but she rejects the phone call and Marcus notices. He says, what, you guys are beefing now? But Poppy doesn't want to talk about it. And Marcus thinks that this is just typical Poppy. If she doesn't see it, it's not there. And he fills her in on what it was like for him when the two broke up. Poppy fled to New York, but he was still there seeing the family every day. This conversation, though, eventually melds into Marcus's current situation with his ex-wife and daughter. His daughter is smart, wants to go touring colleges, but his ex-wife won't allow him to go. And he's really upset by it, and he doesn't really want to fight with his ex, but Poppy reminds him, your daughter is always worth fighting for. They then arrive at the location of the first witness, and they pull out Owen Cave's photo and say, was this a man who came to your house that night? She says, yeah, but he wasn't wearing a police uniform, and he wasn't there long. He was there for maybe two minutes tops until he got a phone call, seemed really annoyed by it, grabbed his partner, and left. And that is very, very alarming. And Poppy's pretty sure she knows who was on the other end of that phone call. So the next day, she goes to visit Melanie and asks her, did you and Owen fight that night? But Melanie says no. Poppy fills her in on the fact that Owen got a phone call that night, seemed annoyed. But Melanie says, Owen Cave did not kill Chuck Berman. He wouldn't have ruined our family like that. But then Melanie coughs up a lot of blood and Poppy decides to take her to the hospital. And as Poppy is sitting there with Melanie passed out in the bed, she starts to have flashbacks of her own situation with her mother when her mom was dying when she was a little kid. A nurse eventually walks in, administers some drugs, and tells Poppy, Melanie's going to be out of it for a little bit. So Poppy sees this as a good opportunity to possibly get the truth. She once again asks Melanie about the fight, saying it would have been completely understandable if you guys were fighting. So tell me, were you on the other end of that call? And Melanie admits, yes, I was. I called up Owen that night to tell him that I was leaving him. And when Owen found out, Owen was furious. So Poppy has talked to the one witness, she's talked to Melanie, but she is yet to talk to the other witness. And the second witness's call was an hour and 15 minutes after the first. But that woman has seemingly disappeared. Poppy asks Noah to track her down, but all public records of her are missing. And Poppy figures that this is a situation of a woman changing her identity because of an abusive relationship. Now, name changes would be public record unless the person changing the name requests that it's not. And Poppy thinks that that's what's going on here. Poppy thinks that Marcus might be able to pull some strings and find out where this woman went. And the next day, Marcus is able to pull those strings and find out where the woman currently lives. So Poppy goes over there and interviews both the woman and her daughter, who's older now. And the woman confirms that Owen Cave came to her house that night. He seemed nice and wanted to help, but he also seemed agitated at times, sweating profusely. But the most memorable thing happened the next day when the woman saw red blotches all over her carpet. And when she got down to clean them, she realized that they were blood. And both her and her daughter remember this because it was so bad they had to get new carpets. So Owen Cave arrived at their house with blood on his shoes and tracked it into their house. And present day Owen Cave is just as agitated as he was back in 1999. He's doing some yard work and gets a phone call and just starts saying, what? When? And you have to assume the person on the other end said, well, do you want me to do anything about it? Because Owen responds to the person, yeah, I want you to go back in time and do it right this time. Owen also realizes, though, that his perception amongst his peers is probably in the toilet with this podcast going out. And he walks up to one fellow officer and tells her, you know, everything on that podcast is just speculation and lies. But you can kind of tell by her reaction that she definitely thinks differently of Owen, but she can't say it because he's a commanding officer. And then Owen gets an email from Poppy telling him, I know you tracked blood into somebody's house the same night Chuck was killed. We need to talk. And it puts the fear of God into Owen. And even Marcus, who was a pretty staunch defender of Owen, says, yeah, he's looking guiltier by the day. I mean, when I was Oakland PD, I never tracked blood in anyone's house. Marcus then, though, pressures Poppy into telling him what the beef is between Poppy and her family. And through this conversation, Poppy realized that she needs to try to be the bigger person and go make it right. So she heads to the bar, walks in, and sees Sidey. And Sidey doesn't want to talk to Poppy, but that doesn't stop Poppy from talking to Sidey. Apologizing, telling her, I'm sorry for everything that happened. That was never my intent. I'm sorry you had to go through that. But as she's apologizing, both Sidey and Shreve start nitpicking the apology. Because Sidey's not here to hear an apology, she's here to fight with her older sister. Poppy, however, just wants to fix it, but eventually she realizes that Sidey's probably a lost cause with that. So she decides to turn to her dad, saying, I know you're mad at me, and you can have that, but I need you to know that I'm mad at you too. Because my father would have never done to me what you did to me the other day. In episode 5, Lainey and Josie head to their aunt's storage facility, and Lainey is trying to convince Josie that maybe she should stay in San Francisco for the time being. Josie then gets a phone call, and it's from home, and when she pulls the phone out, she drops it on the floor, and Lainey sees that it's home. She also sees the background of her, a guy, and his kid. So, for whatever reason, Lainey decides that it's acceptable for her to pick up the phone and answer it, and Josie snatches it out of her hand and turns around to take the phone call. Once again, adopting the British accent, 
but telling her fiance, I'll call you back later. When Josie gets off the phone, she turns to Lainey and questions why she would do that. And Lainey tells her it's because she doesn't feel connected to her at all. Josie doesn't respond, though, just opening up the storage facility. And they realize that the storage facility is packed with their own belongings from their childhood that their aunt kept. So they start going through some of the items, and Lainey says to Josie, I like the name Vivian because she overheard on the phone her fiance call her Vivian. She also says that the British accent kind of threw her off a bit. She's trying to bait Josie into telling her more about her life, but she doesn't. Josie continues to look around the storage facility, pulling down a blanket, revealing a painting of both girls. And when she sees it, she's shook, to the point where she turns to Lainey and says, yeah, I'll meet you in the car. The next day, in the hotel lobby, her mom comes to visit her. And Josie doesn't want to talk to Aaron, but Aaron gives her the whole guilt trip of, hey, my sister just died, why don't you give me some time? There's clearly an awkwardness, though, and finally Aaron breaks it up by saying that Lainey had mentioned the painting, and since she can't have both of her girls back, she wants that, because it turns out she's the one who painted it. And Josie says, yeah, that's fine, but you better go quick, because I paid the guy at the storage facility 100 bucks to clear it out. So Aaron races over there, and lucky for her, all the items are still in there. And it should be a pretty quick trip, but it's not, because Aaron is searching for something in that storage facility, and it is not the painting. She never even finds what she's looking for, and she leaves the painting in the storage facility. And Aaron spent a good amount of time in that storage facility looking for whatever it is she wanted to find. Now, Josie's days in San Francisco are numbered, and Lainey knows that. She heads to her hotel room that night, asking her one more time if she would stay, but Josie says, no, I'm not going to. Lainey apologizes for what she did earlier with the cell phone, and then asks her sister, would you stop by before you leave town just to say goodbye to Ella? And Josie says, yeah, of course. She then says goodbye to her sister and leaves, but when she rounds the corner, she pulls out Josie's cell phone that she snatched off the table and tells Siri, phone home. Now, over with Poppy, she's gotten her clearance back to go visit Warren because she's been labeled as a private investigator. But during their first meeting, she can tell that something is bothering Warren, although he won't say what it is. So Poppy tells Warren what she's found out about the absence of time between Owen's first call and the next call that he got. And when Warren finds out about this, he reveals to Poppy that Owen had him shanked. Poppy gets really concerned for Warren's safety, telling him, you need to get witness protection. But he says, what's the point? Do you know how far his reach goes? Their time comes to an end, and later in the day, Warren goes to that program where he visits the dogs, but Jack the dog isn't there. And he finds out, after Jack attacked the other inmate at the behest of Warren, the dog is labeled at risk and is scheduled to be put down. And Warren gets really upset about this, begging the person to let him talk on the dog's behalf. And they set it up. So in front of two people that, I guess, make the decisions about the dogs, Warren pleads his case for Jack. He starts off reading some things that he wrote on a cue card, but then he speaks from the heart, telling them that he's doing for Jack what his own father wouldn't do for him. Because in the last 19 years, the only person that really trusted him was Jack the dog. And just because you made a mistake doesn't mean he should die for it. This impassioned plea actually works. Jack the dog's life is spared, and he'll be going back to the shelter until they can find a foster home for him. So Warren did some good. So that's what Warren was up to, but after Poppy left, she went back to her office to meet with Marcus and Noah. And Marcus is kind of pissed off at Poppy because she's been doing these episodes shining a light on Owen Cave being guilty when she doesn't have any evidence. And Poppy can't believe what Marcus is saying because he was right there when they uncovered all the evidence. But being a former cop, Marcus knows what evidence looks like, and even though everything is pointing to Owen Cave, nothing would hold up on court. Marcus tells her, you don't blow up a person's life unless you know 100% that they're guilty. And that's when Poppy reminds Marcus about all of the evidence against Owen. And Marcus's patients are running thin. He stands up and tells Poppy, you have no proof. And Poppy screams at him, then get me some. That's the whole reason you're here. Get me the proof. And Marcus takes such offense to that that he says, you know what, I'm done. I'm out of here. And he starts to walk out. And Poppy chases after him saying, whoa, what's your deal? And he tells her, you're hell bent on burying Owen Cave. I mean, it's pretty clear that this guy pushed some kind of buttons in you. Look, if you want me to keep digging, I'll dig. But, Poppy, we're playing with people's lives here. Are you ready for the consequences of that? And apparently she is, because Marcus keeps digging. And that night, Poppy and Ingram end up consummating their marriage. So Poppy's in a pretty good mood when she wakes up. She gets her nose to the grindstone, and she starts digging. And she finds something. So she calls up Marcus and actually wakes him up in bed. And what she's found out is that Owen is listed as the founder of this charity called Angel's Halo. And he's the only name on it, which Poppy finds very fishy. She wants to head to the address and find out more information about it, and she wants Marcus to come along. And as she's talking to Marcus, Ingram overhears the conversation. And he's not even really flustered about the fact that Poppy's working with her ex. He wants to talk about Poppy's dad, Shreve. He tells Poppy, I'm going to file a restraining order against Shreve, and she loses it on him, telling him, you don't understand, you're not blood, you don't get a say in this. Ingram can tell, though, that there's something deep down with this, and asks her, is there something that you're not telling me with this situation? 
I mean, he attacked you. I mean, you know as well as I do, something needs to be done. And Poppy tells him, I know something needs to be done, but I can't do it. And Ingram says, you won't have to. I'll do it. So Ingram heads to the bar and talks to Lillian. And at first, Lillian pushes back about helping Shreve. But the more that Ingram hammers home that Shreve needs help, the more that Lillian finally gives in. Admitting that whatever's going on with Shreve, she had just hoped that it would go away, but it never did. She's worried that whatever it is, it'll be something that takes him away from her. So she convinces Shreve to go get an MRI at the behest of Ingram. And Shreve shows up, telling Ingram, I'm not doing this for you, I'm doing it for Lillian. But he also mentions leaving Poppy in foster care, and that is something that Ingram had no idea about. He tries to ask Lillian about it, but she says, you're going to have to ask your wife. And Ingram's wife linked up with Marcus and headed to that charity where they got stonewalled. The guy there wouldn't really give him any information, not telling him about Owen Cave's relationship to the charity or what even the charity went to. But they didn't exactly hit a dead end because Poppy saw the secretary look Marcus up and down and she tells Marcus, hey, just wait for a lunch break and see if you can find any information because that secretary was very into you. Marcus, though, has to go pick up his daughter, and he picks her up and takes her to a record store, and as they're chatting, he notices somebody walk through the door that doesn't really quite fit the scene, and it's Owen Cave. And as soon as he sees him, he sends his daughter to go wait in the car. Owen Cave then walks up to Marcus and says, tell Poppy to back off, but Marcus tells him, you mess with her family. She's after your head. And at first, Owen tries to appeal to the whole, you're ruining a fellow cop's life, but then he starts to insult Marcus bringing up the fact that he was kicked off the force for accidentally shooting the wrong person, calling Marcus a drunk. Marcus reminds him, though, hey, that was a good shooting. I got acquitted for it. Owen just looks at him and says, tell Parnell to back off or it's going to look bad for us all. And then he walks out. But Marcus doesn't heed Owen's advice, though. He meets up with Poppy at her dad's bar and tells her that he found out there is one beneficiary for that charity. Although there's not a name, there's only one letter. It's J, J, J. But that's not the only thing he found out. He found out that the charity was set up one month after Chuck Berman's death. So the big question is, who is this JJJ person? Because this sounds like hush money. So the next day, Poppy gets on the phone with Warren and tells him about JJJ. Warren is pretty sure he knows who JJJ is. It's a fellow kid in the neighborhood, football star, whose name was John James Jackson. So when she gets this information, Poppy texts Owen, John James Jackson says time's up. And that text could not have arrived at a worse time. Because that morning, as Owen was ready to leave for work, he opened the door and the mayor was there. She didn't want to do it in the office, but she put Owen on leave as they open up an internal investigation based on Poppy's podcast. So he's already in a bad mood. On top of it, his wife seems to be leaving him, at least for the time being. She's taking their son and going to her mom's place. So the world seems to be crumbling in on Owen Cave. So much so that that night he actually heads to Melanie's place. Starting this woe is me campaign about his life is ruined, but also how he ruined the relationship between him and Melanie. And when Melanie tries to calm him down, Owen kisses her, which she pushes him back. Screaming at him, you left us. You took everything from me and Warren. He starts to apologize, but she just kicks him out of the house. So his job and career seem to be in shambles. His wife has left him and his ex-wife just kicked him out of the house. And with nowhere else to go, he grabs a bottle and heads to Poppy's place, drinking pretty much all of it, and then breaking in and waiting for her to arrive. And when she does, he demands that she record a retraction at gunpoint. And she starts to do it, but it's obvious she's doing it under duress. And eventually she stops, and he screams at her, You ruined my life. Poppy explains that the story is incomplete. If Owen wants to clear his name, they're going to have to sit down and do an interview. She asks him, You're doing all of this because I found out about JJJ? But Owen starts to plead his innocence, telling her that he just jumped out in the middle of the street. He was wearing all black. Owen didn't see him. Owen starts to tell her, I'm a good person. I put that kid in the best facility. I did that. And this is all information that Marcus actually uncovered, but hadn't told Poppy yet. That JJJ was a car accident victim who was left paralyzed in a living facility. Where Owen Cave, the only person who donated to the cause, was basically paying for it all. Poppy, however, didn't know this. She just thought that she unearthed who JJJ was. So this is all a revelation of Poppy. And that's when she realizes, that's where you were for the 74 minutes. Owen tells her, I didn't call the police because I figured my career would be down the drain. Poppy, though, is shocked and terrified because she's still at gunpoint as Owen Cave continues to tell her how good of a man he is. He also tells her that Warren killed Chuck Berman. And another example of how good of a man he is is because he put his own son in prison because he knew that his son was guilty. He then pulls the trigger on himself, committing suicide in front of Poppy. And that isn't the only bad news that she got. Because Noah got a tip on their website, and when she went to go follow it up, it was a guy who worked for the city as a street cleaner, who on the night of Chuck Berman's murder, 
saw Warren hop the fence with a knife. So it looks like everything that Owen said about Warren was actually right. Episode 6 kicks off with the funeral, and Warren arrives, and he's able to meet his brother for the first time. But afterwards, he's looking all over for his mother. She's not there. He asks Poppy, do you know where she is? She was supposed to be here. Poppy doesn't know, though, and she's not really in a mood to talk to Warren, and Warren can tell. She hasn't talked to him in a week, and Poppy tells him, you lied to me. A witness has come forward, placing you leaving the Berman house at the time of the murder. And Warren is visibly annoyed, and she's annoyed that he doesn't deny it. The two get into an argument about trust, but before Warren's taken back to prison, he turns to Poppy and says, There's blood on your hands, too. Why do you think my father killed himself? It was because of you and your podcast. Poppy, though, gets in her car and drives home where a painter has just left, cleaning up the mess of Owen Cave. She starts to beat herself up to Ingram, saying, I never should have done this podcast. I'm going to record one final episode, and then that's that. I'm done with Warren Cave. But right before she goes in to record the final episode, Noah shows up very excited because somebody had tagged the show's Instagram account to let them know that there was an auction going on with a bunch of items from the Berman estate, including, by the way, that painting that Aaron did of both girls. More importantly, though, some of the items that were for auction were some home movies and Lainey's diary. And Noah scooped them up, thinking that they can rip the audio from the home movies and put it in the podcast. It would be great. But Poppy tells her, Noah, I'm done with this story. And Noah isn't happy about that because she thinks the story is unfinished. She shows Poppy the diary, and the diary is all written in code, but there's two different sets of handwriting. And she thinks that the one is obviously Lainey, but the other must be Josie. All they need to do is crack the code. This could be the breakthrough they're looking for. Because the diary has entries of the day of the murder, leading up to it and after. So Noah wants to switch gears focusing on the Berman women. But Poppy reiterates, Noah, we are done with this story. Poppy then goes and records the final episode, but she doesn't put it out yet because she still has to edit it. Later that night when Poppy gets home, Ingram has invited her entire family over because Ingram feels like after what happened with Owen Cave, Poppy needs her family and her family also needs her. So everybody kind of makes up and has a nice little dinner, including Poppy's dad, where Shreve kind of apologizes for leaving her in foster care. But everything's forgiven, water under the bridge, everybody has a really nice night. After the dinner, though, Ingram asks Poppy, why didn't you ever tell me about your father leaving you in foster care? And Poppy explains that it wasn't really foster care, it was more of a family friend who took kids in. And while Ingram thinks he knows, he doesn't truly know how hard she grew up. She then gets a phone call from Marcus and sends it to voicemail, but Ingram saw who called her. And he tells Poppy, you should air that last episode. And this might be an indication that I want you to air that last episode because I'm sick of Marcus being around. Either way, though, he feels like she needs to put it out there. Get closure to this whole thing. Marcus and Poppy, though, eventually do meet up. And Marcus starts trying to talk her back into the case, not airing that last episode. Continuing down the rabbit hole to truth. And Poppy realized that Noah must have had a talk with Marcus, and he admits it. Yeah, why wouldn't she? Marcus explains that the street sweeper's testimony actually puts more doubt in everything, because he said Warren was running into the street, and that contradicts what Lainey said. She said he was hopping the back fence. One of them is lying. It goes back to the original question, what was Lainey lying about? Poppy, though, is just so sick of this case. She yells at Marcus, Owen Cave put a gun to his head in my house. What more has to happen in this case for you people to realize that I'm done? And Marcus shoots back, the whole reason we're here right now is because you turned your back on the truth 19 years ago. Do you want to go back to that again? He then pulls out Lainey's diary, which Noah gave him, and says, we need to figure out what this code means. But Poppy says, Warren is guilty. And Marcus tells her, then prove it. Look, Poppy, I don't give a shit about Owen Cave, but prove it to yourself. He then slides the diary into her purse and leaves. And Poppy needs to get some answers. And she can't go to Lainey or Josie. And Josie was actually planning on leaving, heading back to New York when her fiancé showed up. Because that phone call that Lainey made was to tell her fiancé about everything. The real truth. Who Josie really was. And he understandably is pretty pissed off. So Josie hops in an Uber and heads to Lainey's house, screaming at her, because now her fiancé wants to meet the family. And Lainey's a little puzzled by this behavior, because she tells Josie, you're the one who's been lying about us, acting like we don't exist. And Josie screams at her, for good reason. You had no right to call him. And Lainey's taken aback, saying, I had no right? What about you? You sold all of our childhood stuff to some guy on the internet. Because Lainey saw the post that had all of their stuff available for sale. But Josie tells her, no, I paid the guy at the storage facility 100 bucks to clear everything out. Well, he didn't. And if you've ever seen the show Storage Wars, you can figure out what happened next. They both kind of start playing the blame game, and Lainey grabs her and says, all right, just, you know, calm down. I'm sorry I called him, but why don't you just invite him over and we can answer any questions he has. 
And Josie reluctantly agrees. So Josie and her fiancé come over for dinner, and they meet Lainey and Alex, Lainey's husband, but also Aaron. Josie didn't have any idea that Aaron was going to be there, and she doesn't seem too thrilled that she's there. Either way, though, they're there, so you might as well eat, and everybody seemingly has a nice dinner where Lainey and Josie's fiancé agree to clean up. And as Lainey is washing dishes, she casually says to the fiancé, you know, it's great that you're in the picture because it seems like all those outbursts and institutional visits are behind her and in the past. I mean, I was a little concerned with the fake identity thing, but it seems like you and your son are really good for her. And you can tell by his face that he has never heard about any of this before. Lainey then asks him, "Uh, do you leave Josie alone with your son? And he says, yeah, of course, why? And Lainey plants a trap saying, oh, yeah, nothing. There was just some issues when we were a kid. Goading him into asking what kind of issues, and he does. He falls for it. And she tells him that Josie tried smothering Lainey with a pillow when they were kids, which we know to be the exact opposite of what happened. Lainey brushes it off like it's in the past and it's behind him, but this is all an orchestrated plan by her to get in the head of Josie's fiancé. And now Josie's fiancé is questioning who he's really engaged to. But the whole time, Poppy has been trying to crack the code in Lainey's diary. Unfortunately for her, she can't, and she knows that there might be one person who knows how to crack it, and that's Warren Cave. So she heads back to San Quentin, and the first thing she asks him is, did you put a hit out on me? Because the previous night when Poppy got home, her house was broken into, and somebody rummaged through her things, and she figured it was Warren Cave. Well, Warren says, no, I didn't, but I wish I did. And Warren kind of wants an apology with Poppy wanting an apology, both feeling like they betrayed each other, with Warren once again saying, I told you already, I was not there that night. And if you think I'm so guilty, why did you even come back here? Poppy explains how what the street sweeper said contradicts what Lainey said, and somebody must have lied. So she's there to find out the truth. She then pulls out Lainey's diary and shows it to Warren, asking if he knows about it in the code. And he says, no, it's written in code. Pretty sure it stands for Poppy's full of shit. While Warren is giving her a hard time, though, he sees the leader of the Aryan Brotherhood who is watching this meeting go down. And it's an awkward interaction for Warren because just a couple hours before, he went to the Aryan Brotherhood looking to get back in their good graces, apologizing for even conducting interviews with Poppy. He also tried to plead his loyalty to them, saying that he never left in the first place. But they weren't happy with what he did. Warren realized that he might not be getting out of prison after all, and he needs protection. The leader demands a gesture to show his loyalty, but you also get some gay prison vibes in the interaction, with the leader walking up to Warren and talking about how families take care of each other with Warren trembling. And that fits, because everybody knows the Aryan Brotherhood, you know, like to casually have gay prison sex. It's just it's a thing everybody knows. But Warren is definitely now concerned with the fact that the leader of the Aryan Brotherhood knows he's once again talking to Poppy. And Poppy can tell that Warren is suddenly distracting, and then she sees who is distracting Warren. And she asks him, who was the first person you met when you got here? You're a 17-year-old boy. What was your first night like? Who befriended you? And Warren doesn't need to answer the question because everybody in the room knows the answer. It was the Brotherhood. So Poppy once again points to the diary and says, come on, talk to me. Help me out here. What does this diary say? So Warren starts to speak to her, telling her that when he used to break into the Berman household... He used to read Lainey's diary under her bed. She had no idea about this. It was kind of just a crush thing. But he clearly used to know the code. Although it was 20 years ago, he's having trouble remember. And Poppy urges him, all right, come on, try, give me something. And Warren gives her enough information where she can figure out how to decipher the code. After the meeting with Poppy, Warren headed back to his cell where, under his mattress, he's kept this old letter that Lainey wrote him way back in the day that was written in that code. After the meeting with Warren, Poppy headed back to her office with Noah and Marcus and started to transcribe the diary. And what she uncovers is that Chuck Berman was molesting Lainey. Poppy hypothesizes that if Lainey told her mom, it could have been Aaron or it could have been Warren who was reading the diary. And Marcus tells them that if a father is molesting the daughter and the mom finds out and the father ends up dead, you can bet your life on the fact that the mother did it. And Noah then reminds the group of Aaron's shaky alibi, that she was passed out drunk that night. That's why she didn't hear anything. Noah's never believed that story. Noah then asks, do you think Lainey will give her mom up? And Poppy says, well, you've seen their relationship. It seems shaky, so maybe if we press the right buttons, Lainey will turn on her mom. So Poppy tracks Lainey down at a car wash while she's waiting to get her car washed, and she hops in the passenger side, and as soon as she does, Lainey starts telling her, you've got to get out of here, but Poppy doesn't leave. Poppy asks her, once again, why did you lie about Warren? Because a witness has come forward and is contradicting your story. One of you two is lying, and my money is on you. Lainey tries playing the no comment card, but as she pulls into the car wash, Poppy asks, how long was your dad molesting you? And Lainey is absolutely floored that Poppy knows this. 
Poppy can see this on her face and tells her that she was able to crack the code in the diary. That's how she found out. This is bringing back a rush of emotion for Lainey as Poppy asks her, did your mother know? And Lainey is speechless, just nodding yes. So Poppy asks, well, did your mother kill Chuck and have you lie to the police? And Lainey starts to get animated, saying everything my mother did was to protect me, but she didn't kill Chuck. Lainey then loses it on Poppy, saying, could you even imagine having a father that you idolize and he turns into a monster? Did that wreck me? Yes. Was I institutionalized twice? Yes. And each time it was my mother who got me through that. So please, just leave me alone. And Poppy gets out of the car and lets Lainey go about her day. Poppy then goes and meets up with Marcus because she wants Lainey's medical records from that institutionalized stay. But Marcus can't get them because they're sealed. He tells Poppy something about Lainey's story just doesn't feel right. And Poppy wants the medical records just to corroborate her story or maybe find out more information about what was ticking in Lainey's head. But while Marcus couldn't get Lainey's medical records, what he was able to do is get the board of trustees for the institution that she was hospitalized at. And one of the women on the board of directors happens to be married to someone who works at Ingram's law firm. So Poppy suggests that Ingram invite them both over for dinner, and they're yucking it up, having a great time. And when Ingram and his coworker go outside to smoke cigars, that's when Poppy starts to try to finagle her way into getting those records. She starts to place breadcrumbs, subtly asking what the woman does, and she says that she works in a psychiatric facility. She then finds out the woman is a big fan of her podcast, so she invites her on her series called the Formidable Women series, about strong women in the workforce. But this is all in a buttering up attempt for the real question. Poppy asks her, how would I get the medical records for Lainey Berman? And the woman kind of looks at her cross-eyed, saying, are you asking me to get these for you? And Poppy explains, I wanted to ask if it wasn't for the utmost importance. I mean, this could be the breakthrough we need to get an innocent man out of prison. And that's when it clicks with this woman that all of this, the whole dinner, the charade, it's been orchestrated so Poppy could get the medical records. And the woman is so turned off that when Ingram and her husband come through the door, she turns to her husband and says, it's time to go. And once they do leave, Ingram turns to Poppy and says, what the hell just happened? And Poppy explains the situation and Ingram flies off the handle because he really thought that Poppy was done with this whole case. But Poppy says, things change. He point blank asks her, did you invite them over here to help your story? And Poppy doesn't say anything, but her silence is answer enough. And Ingram is so upset because he feels like he just got used. He yells at her, you were damaged. Being back here on the West Coast around your family, I see all the crazy and dysfunction that you guys mistake for communication. But it's twisted. It's made you think that me being respectful is a sign of weakness. And don't think I don't see you smiling in Marcus's face as you guys run around town like Bonnie and Clyde. Either you're a fool or even worse, I am. And then he walks out. So Poppy heads upstairs into her office and starts trying to bury herself into her work, re-watching the tape of Lainey's initial interview with the police. And she can see that somebody is off camera who Lainey is looking at right before she says that Warren did it. And Poppy really wants to know who that person is, but she's pretty sure that that person is Aaron, who, for the time being, is staying at Lainey's house while she's in town. And since she didn't find whatever it is she was looking for in the storage facility, when Lainey left for the day, she started looking through Lainey's house for the item. But she came up empty there as well. The item, by the way, is a little metal statue of a bird that Lainey used to have as a child. That night, though, while she's sitting on the porch with Lainey, she tells her, You have no idea what I've done for this family. You don't realize what I've sacrificed for both you and Josie. You need me. Lainey also gets a phone call that night from Josie because Josie's fiancé has decided that his whole marriage thing isn't going to really work with him and he breaks it off. And Josie has no idea about the conversation that her ex-fiancé and Lainey had earlier in the night. Lainey tells her, why don't you just come over here and you can stay here. And when Josie says, okay, it's as if Lainey's master plan has finally been completed. In episode 6, Warren gets ready to meet Poppy, but right before he goes into the meeting, the guard gives him a shank, telling him that the leader of the Aryan Brotherhood will tell him who that shank is for. He then goes in to meet with Poppy, where she lets him know that the code works, she was able to transcribe the diary, and what she found was that Lainey was getting molested by Chuck. And you can tell by his reaction that he really had no idea. He asks Poppy, so you think Lainey did it? And she tells him that she actually thinks that Aaron did it. She did it to protect her daughter, and then she coached her daughter into labeling Warren as the killer. Warren tries to figure out why Aaron would do that to him, and Poppy asks him, well, did she act suspiciously leading up to the party? And he tells her that she wasn't really around. She was gone for about a month that September, right before Halloween. And that is something that Poppy can definitely look into. Where did Aaron go? He then heads back to the cell and rereads the letter that Lainey sent him way back in the day, and she actually sent it to him while she was incarcerated in a mental institution. She was apologizing, saying, I feel like you probably hate my guts and you didn't even read this, but I'm all alone too, and I don't want to go back to the real world. She ends it by saying, I love you. Don't write back. Love, Lainey. 
And the two, right before all this went down, actually had a little bit of a fling where Warren had his first kiss. It's got him thinking a lot about Lainey and that field and that kiss, which is kind of ironic because that day, Lainey and Josie head to that exact field. They used to spend tons of time there. Josie sets it up as a, hey, we used to spend a lot of time here kind of situation. Josie tells Lainey she decided to stay a little bit, and Lainey tries to get Josie to agree to stay with them for the time being. Josie, though, doesn't answer because she just uncorked a bottle of wine and the cork goes flying near a tree. And when the girls go to get it, Josie starts having a weird flashback from their childhood about this tree, about burying a bird, and it's a flashback that she can't really shake. In prison, though, Warren goes to meet the leader of the Aryan Brotherhood to see who he's supposed to shank as a sign when he sees a shirtless white kid walk by who can't be more than 19 years old. Warren thinks he has a pretty good idea of why this kid is shirtless and why the kid is walking with his head down. He himself is having some flashbacks about his first couple nights in San Quentin. And his theories are confirmed when he sees the leader of the Aryan Brotherhood come out from behind a wall, pulling up his pants. Told you, those Aryan Brotherhood guys, they just love their gay prison sex. Warren walks towards the guy, and the guy grabs Warren and jacks him up against the wall while also grabbing at his, uh, let's just say he's doing a Donald Trump impression. And Warren is kind of scared again, just repeating, I didn't see anything. And the guy says, yeah, what exactly was there to see? He then starts belittling Warren, making him feel inferior, and that's when Warren takes out that shank and stabs him. He starts stabbing him over and over, letting him know, whose face do you think I see when I go to bed at night? Warren, though, realizes, I probably shouldn't leave the body here, so he drags it inside a maintenance closet, switches shirts, because his shirt was covered in blood, and then leaves it there. It doesn't take long, though, for the Aryan Brotherhood to wonder where their leader is, and what looks like the second in the command walks up to Warren very suspiciously and asks, do you have any idea where he is? And Warren the whole time is playing dumb, acting like, no, I don't know where he is. I saw him yesterday. But shortly after that, the guards locate the body and everybody goes into lockdown. Because of this, Warren thinks that his time might be coming to an end. So he finagles a way to get a cell phone and calls up Lainey Berman, begging her to come. He tells her, I need to see you before it's too late. And to his utter surprise, she actually shows up. When she sits down, he tells her, I had to get rid of hating you. And that's because I'm going to die in here. He then smashes the letter up against the glass and asks, do you remember writing this to me? And she says, I didn't even think you got it. He tells her how he knows it by heart, and there was only one thing that made him want to keep it. And that's the part where she told him that she loved him. He wants to know if it's true. She starts to try to formulate the words as she kind of hyperventilate a little bit, saying, nothing I can say right now can help you. She starts to try to talk again, but Warren just says, don't. And he starts to repeat some of the letter, and she actually finishes it, so... She definitely remembers it. She then puts her hand up against the glass and he follows suit. And that's when he says, you should have told me about your father. And Lainey pulls back, kind of embarrassed. And she starts to get confrontational about it, yelling at him, you think you have the missing piece to the whole mystery now? He cuts her off, though, and says, if I had known, I would have killed him myself. He then lets her know that she is still the only girl he's ever kissed. And she tells him, you are still the only boy I've ever loved. At this point, Warren is crying and nodding. But then he asks the big question, then why did you lie about me? And unfortunately for Warren, that's one too many questions for Lainey, and Lainey hangs up the phone as Warren screams for an answer that he's never going to get. Now, all this time, Poppy started digging into where Aaron went in that month. She had Marcus look into it, and Marcus found that she was arrested for drunk driving and was ordered to go to rehab in August of 99. So that's where she was. Poppy thinks, well, if she was fresh out of rehab, she might have been actually sober that night, but Marcus reminds her, that's a big if. I know a lot of alcoholics that as soon as they get out of rehab, they go right to the liquor store. So now they need to visit the rehab to find out if the sobriety actually stuck. When they go there, though, they get stonewalled because the place isn't going to give them information on past clients. But she is able to find out who Aaron's sobriety coach was. And when Poppy interviews the sobriety coach, the sobriety coach told her that she was stone cold sober when she called in a rage because Chuck was looking at Melanie. She also lets her know that Aaron was on a drug that would make her throw up if she drank alcohol. And she was on this drug the night of the murder. Which begs the question, if she was sober the night of the murder, then why did she lie to the police? And in order to get more information about it, Poppy decides to head and talk to Alex, Lainey's husband. Now, at first, Alex tries to stonewall her, but that's when Poppy says, if you want Aaron out of your life, and more importantly, your life back with Lainey, then help me fill in the gaps and get closer to Aaron. The only information, though, that Alex really has for her is the fact that they had to bail Aaron out of jail the week she came home. She broke into their old house, and the new owners had to call the police when they found her. You would think all of this information Marcus would have seen on her police record, but he didn't, but it's new information nonetheless. So Marcus and Poppy head to the old house, which is surrounded by true crime enthusiasts thanks to Poppy's new podcast, and the owners show 
show them where they found Aaron. It was in the basement of their house. She snuck in through a bathroom window that wasn't connected to their alarm system. That right there leads Poppy to believe this isn't the first house that Aaron's broken into. They asked the owners, what did she do when you caught her? And they say that Aaron laughed and then apologized and said that she was feeling nostalgic. They were creeped out by it. Now, there was nothing missing or stolen, but there was what looks like a furnace open that wasn't open before. So it was obvious that Aaron was looking for something. Marcus and Poppy then head back to the office and meet up with Noah and start hypothesizing on what she could have been looking for, and they figure it must have been the murder weapon that was never found. This makes perfect sense to Noah. She hid the knife before the cops came, and once this podcast came out, she needed to go back and get it because she's now afraid that Poppy's going to figure out that she did it. Marcus also finds this interesting, that for 20 years, Aaron stayed away, but as soon as the podcast started, she came back to cover her tracks. The only issue, Poppy says, is the fact that she never found the murder weapon, because there was nothing on her when they arrested her. Poppy knows that Aaron is impulsive and nervous, so she figures she needs to smoke her out. And she instills the help of the owners of the former house to call up Aaron and tell her, hey, we found what you were looking for. And when Aaron stops by, they say, yeah, we found what you were looking for deep in the old furnace. Give us five grand and it's yours, or we're going to the police. Aaron demands to see it, but they don't hand it over, so she says, okay, then what was it? And they say, a knife? And Aaron just chuckles and leaves. The owners call Poppy and tell her what happened, and this played out exactly as Poppy expected. It confirms what Poppy already believed, that Aaron is guilty because she showed up in the first place. And now, at least they know that they're not looking for a knife. After this meeting, though, Aaron went back to the house and got ripped, where Josie found her drunk on the floor. And once she actually becomes sober, Josie kind of yells at her a little bit because of the fact that she found her adult mother drunk again. Aaron then turns it on Josie, asking her what she's planning on doing now that her fiancé left her, and Josie says, I don't know. Aaron then changes the subject, telling Josie, I tried to protect you. And once she says this, Josie gets a rush of flashbacks from her mother burning letters as her and her sister watch. And these memories make Josie uncomfortable, so she answers Aaron's previous question, telling her, yeah, I think I'm going to stay in Menlo Park for a while. And Aaron thinks this is great because it'll be great for Lainey. Aaron tells Josie, maybe I can come home for Christmas, which is the first time that Josie is hearing that her mom's leaving. And Josie asks her mom, why don't you just stay? Take this time to clean yourself up, start over. Josie then takes another turn in the conversation, telling her mom, you know, I left you guys for 17 years, thinking that it would help. But no matter how many miles I put between us, I'm still just that scared, stupid teenage girl. I don't think any of us ever left that hallway where dad died. I've already said goodbye to enough people in my life, and I can't do it anymore, and neither can you. So, stay. And as Aaron is crying, she kind of nods a yes. Later in the day, Aaron gets a phone call from a very unlikely person, Melanie. She walks in to see that Melanie is in fact dying, where Melanie tells her that dying people like to make amends. They start reminiscing about how they used to be the queens of the neighborhood, and Melanie quips, <laughs> too bad we didn't know how good we had it, but Aaron says, I did you fucked my husband and melanie admits that yes yeah, sleeping with your husband was definitely bad and aaron says that doesn't sound like much of an apology but melanie tells her that's as close as you're gonna get as aaron gets up to leave melanie says you know it was purifying for me to face my demons you might want to do it too and that's when poppy pops out of the room and surprises aaron and aaron is completely taken off guard with melanie telling aaron i know you lied about my son and she screams at her just tell the damn truth but instead aaron just flees the house as she's trying to get to her car, Poppy's following her and says, you knew Chuck was abusing Lainey. That's motive. Aaron demands to know who told Poppy that, and Poppy tells her it was Lainey. And Aaron actually tries to say, well, she doesn't know what she's talking about. That's when Poppy tells her that she also knows about the drugs that would make her throw up if she was drinking and she was on on the night of the murder. Add in all of this and the fact that she was hunting for the murder weapon, it's pretty damning. Poppy says, I think when you were in rehab, alone and sober, it was tough for you, knowing what your husband was doing to your daughter the entire time. It must have eaten you up knowing that it all happened under your roof while you were stuck in a bottle. Aaron tells her, I didn't kill my husband, but Poppy says, I know you did. I'm putting the piece together and the picture looks real bad for you. But I can help because all those articles that I wrote 19 years ago got Warren tried as an adult. That shows my words have power. Now, do you want that power wielded against you or to help you? Because I'm doing the next episode with or without you. But just know, I'm the difference between the world seeing you as a cold-blooded murderer or a loving mother who would do anything to protect her daughter. And it doesn't take long for Aaron to see the light and say, all right, I'll give you your interview. But I need some time. And the two agree to meet at Susan's the next morning. Poppy then heads to the cemetery where her mother is buried and she meets up with her father. They start reminiscing about Poppy's mom. But then Shreve gets to the real reason why he asked Poppy there. It's to tell her that he has CTE. Now, it's not proven because the doctors won't know until he's actually dead, but he's pretty positive. He's just forgetting things, and he's scared of what he will become. Now, that's what Poppy did after leaving her little impromptu meeting with Aaron. 
Aaron, on the other hand, ended up calling Lainey, who is in a very emotional state after her meeting with Warren. And the first thing Aaron does is kind of yell at Lainey for telling Poppy about the fact that Chuck was abusing her. She then asks Lainey, all right, where is it? Because it's not in the storage space. It's not in the old home. And Lainey, actually, she doesn't know what she's talking about. And that really annoys Aaron. She says, all right, I'm done. I can't take this anymore. I'm going to talk. I'm going to tell the truth. And I'm going to tell her everything that I know. Maybe this way I can fix things the right way. Lainey cuts her mom off and says, just stay at Aunt Susan's. I'll be right over. We can talk about this. So Lainey heads over there and tells her mom, we'll do the interview together. We'll get this over with. But as her mom is sipping some wine, Lainey pulls out three pills. And she tells her mom that they're painkillers. And Aaron wants to chew those bad boys up like they're M&Ms. She gives all three of them to Aaron and Aaron downs them with the wine. And shortly after that, Aaron collapses. And it's important to remember what Lainey does for a living. She's a death doula. She literally helps people die. And after Aaron collapses, she basically goes into work mode, putting her mom in bed and saying everything's fine, but everything is clearly not fine with Aaron. You get the impression that what she took wasn't exactly painkillers. And finally, with Poppy, she recorded her latest episode, but afterwards, she heads over to Lainey's house. When Alex answered the door, he says, Lainey's not here right now. And that's because Lainey was over at Susan's house. Emma comes running downstairs, though, with a church fan from Poppy's house that she was actually looking for. It belonged to her mother. So when Emma comes running downstairs with it, Poppy's a little taken aback and says, where did you get that? And that's when Emma says, mommy gave it to me. And in the season finale, Poppy goes over to Susan's house to interview Aaron. But to her surprise, Aaron is being wheeled out by the coroner. And she looks on the porch where Lainey is giving her statement to the police. But when Lainey makes eye contact with Poppy, she gives her a kind of sly smirk to indicate, yeah, I got you. So Poppy has nothing to do but head back to her office where she meets up with Marcus. And she does not believe for a second that Aaron committed suicide. And that's the story that Lainey told the police. Poppy thinks that Lainey was the one who killed her. Marcus has secured the toxicology report, which says that Aaron died of fentanyl. But the dose is so exact that most people die of an overdose, and the dose is massive. This is as if a professional did it, which Lainey is. So the way they have this figured out, Aaron was about to come on the podcast and told Lainey. And Lainey, who actually killed her dad, couldn't let that happen. So she drugged her mother and killed her. And this story would make sense to the police because Aaron has had a problem with the prescription pills. So they wouldn't think anything of it. Poppy, though, then gets a phone call from Warren, and he lets her know, I don't think I have long. The cops release me back into Gen Pop. I don't think I'm going to make it throughout the day. But listen, if I die before my mother, you have to promise to keep this from her. Although, before he can finish that statement, the Aryan Brotherhood grabs him and bashes his head and starts beating the crap out of him. He is saved, however, by the guards, but it gives you an idea of what Warren is going through. Because as they escort him back to his cell, everybody wants a piece of Warren Cave. But at this point, Warren doesn't even care. He actually goes to the tattoo artist and has all of his Aryan Brotherhood tattoos removed, which the artist lets him know, this is going to bring some heavy heat on you. But Warren's thing is, hey man, I'm already dead anyway, what does it matter? And maybe Warren did have a little coming to Jesus moment, but he also realized that he needs protection, and showing up to the black gang with Aryan Brotherhood tattoos does him no favors, and that's what he does. He goes to their leader begging for help, because he has nowhere else to turn. The way that Warren figures it, you don't like the Aryan Brotherhood, and they're after me, so this could be a win-win for both of us. But that is not how the leader of the black gang sees it. He sees it as, why would I risk anything for you? And the leader lets him know, I don't dislike you, but that's because I dislike your people so much. And that's when Warren shows him the covered up tattoo saying, they're not my people anymore. Warren begs him, but the leader lets him know, if they protect Warren, that means they'll likely go to war. And at the moment, it's been pretty quiet. And he doesn't want to risk losing one of his soldiers for Warren Cave. So unfortunately, it's a no. So Warren has nothing left to do but to go back to his cell and wait for the ass kicking. And while Warren was begging for protection, Josie was finding out that her mother died via her sister at a diner. Lainey is, quote, filling in Josie on all the details. And the story that Lainey tells her is that Aaron called her slurring her words, talking about Poppy Parnell. And when Lainey went over to Susan's house to calm her down, Aaron was already dead. But Josie doesn't think this story makes a lot of sense. First of all, they'd agreed to start over. And second of all, she questions Lainey, why would she call you? She's never been vulnerable to you before. And these are questions that Lainey doesn't really have answers for. But Josie isn't the only one trying to get answers, because Poppy is also trying to get answers, but on Lainey. She goes to Ingram and tries to get his help to find out if the doctor that treated Lainey is still at the medical facility. And Ingram is kind of floored by this, because their marriage has not been great. And he actually thought that Poppy wanted to discuss it. But instead, she just wants to discuss the Warren Cave case. Ingram then confronts Poppy about her stay in foster care. He did some digging and found out that Poppy's foster mother had drowned in front of her a little under a year after she got there. 
And Poppy lets him know it's something I don't like to talk about. Poppy gets visibly upset, telling Ingram, I couldn't help my mother when she died, and then I couldn't help my foster mom when she was dying. And it dawns on Ingram, that is why Poppy is so attached to this case. She wants to help Warren because she couldn't help those others. So he agrees to see what he can do on the doctor matter, but he does let her know that he got a job offer to take over his father's firm back in New York. And this catches Poppy completely off guard. Ingram says, I'm helping you with this case so you can be done with it and so we can get back to what we used to be. So for now, Poppy has her way and she goes and meets up with Noah. And Noah has been combing through the family videos that she bought and she's noticed something. There's tons of Chuck and Aaron and Josie, but most of the videos do not contain Lainey. While discussing it, Poppy gets a phone call from Ingram and Ingram lets her know that Lainey's old doctor does still in fact work at the facility. But he then says, hey, think about moving back to New York. And this phone call is on speakerphone. So Noah hears it, and she is completely caught off guard by it. But Poppy gives her a gesture, don't say anything. And once he gets off the phone with Ingram, Noah says, you got to be kidding me. You're moving back? But Poppy says, don't worry about that. Let's just focus on the Lainey Berman case. But Poppy knows that she needs more help. She needs Josie. So she finds her at the pool, and she lets her know that she was going to see Aaron when Aaron died. Because Aaron was supposed to come on our podcast and do an interview. But as everybody knows now, Aaron never got the chance to, and Poppy does not think that's an accident. Poppy tells Josie, I think your sister killed your father, and once she found out that Aaron was going to come clean, she killed her too. You are the only one left. And let's not forget, for 17 years, you cut her off. You changed your name. You made sure that she was never going to be able to reach you. So if there's even a tiny part of you that believes that any of this could be true, you have to help me. So Josie agrees to help. And what Poppy has her do is head to the mental institution and get Lainey's records. Since they're identical twins, Josie's just going to pose as Lainey and sign them out. And she's able to do that. She is almost caught by her old doctor, but she lies her way through it. And Josie heads back to the car as her and Poppy comb through the records to find out what Lainey was going through. And more importantly, what the doctors found. And one of the things that Lainey displayed an unhealthy obsession with Josie. She described being separated from Josie as a physical pain. But the biggest thing in the medical records is the fact that the doctors there thought that Lainey made up the whole Chuck was abusing her story. And this was in an effort to ruin the relationship between Josie and Chuck. Poppy asks her, is there anything you can remember from that night? But a lot of it, Josie's blocked out. She gets little bits and pieces now and then, but that's about it. So Poppy takes Josie back to Noah's house to show her something. And it's one of those home videos the night they had the Halloween party. And all the way in the background, you see a metal bird. But there was two of them. And when the police showed up the night of the murder, there was only one left. And Noah tells Josie, we think that's the murder weapon. Do you have any idea where it might be? And Josie does, in fact, know where it is. She takes her back to that field where she had a picnic earlier with Lainey. And right near that tree where the cork landed, that's where they buried the murder weapon. And Josie digs it up, and it is still there. And not only is it still there, it's still got Chuck's dry blood on it. And when Josie sees it, she gets a rush of memories back. The first one being that she questioned Lainey on why she would write in her diary that their dad was molesting her. But Lainey swore that it was true. So the night of the murder, when Lainey and Chuck got into a fight, it was actually Josie who was the one who stabbed Chuck repeatedly. Ultimately killing him in defense of her sister. Because she couldn't believe what her dad was, quote, doing, even though it was all a lie. And when this revelation comes back, Josie is sitting there mortified and pretty shook. Because she remembers that she was the one who killed her father. And it's a pretty bad day when you find out you were actually the one to kill your father. But it's not like Lainey was having a great day either. She was at work filling out a death certificate when her boss came up to her and fired her. Because that grandson that she had sex with, well, he talked. Lainey's profile went through the roof after the podcast was released. And he pretty much told everybody that after his grandmother died, him and Lainey did the dirty. And that extracurricular activity got Lainey fired. When she heads home, Alex isn't too happy because the cops showed up at his door wondering about Lainey administering prescription drugs from her patients, and he didn't have any answers. But he also doesn't have any answers on what his wife might have done with clients. And even though Lainey swears that she didn't have an affair, Alex doesn't really believe her. So, much like Owen Cave, looks like her career's over and her marriage is over. And to cap off the night, she gets a phone call from Poppy letting her know that they need to meet up immediately. And while Josie is sitting in Poppy's car, Poppy informs Lainey on everything that went down that day and how Josie has come clean. And Lainey tells Poppy, yeah, okay, your golden boy Warren is going to go free, but Josie? She can't survive prison and she's going to be arrested for it. She's the weak twin. She'll never make it. But Poppy reminds her, you're complacent in this also. You lied. You lied about your father and you lied about Warren. 
Just say it was you, or Josie's going to end up paying the ultimate price. And those records, it says you love her so much, well, now's your time to prove it. But Lainey doesn't bite, throwing it back at Poppy, saying, no, you're the one with the decision to make. Figure it out. So Poppy needs some guidance, and she heads to the bar to talk to Desiree about the situation. She doesn't want to throw Josie in prison, because she feels like Josie is just as much of a victim as Warren is. And while getting Warren out would be great, if she puts Josie in prison, she's just replacing Warren's guilt with Josie's. But Desiree doesn't give her a lot of advice, just saying, I know you're hurting, but you're the only one who can figure out what to do in this. So the plan they come up with is for the Bermans to go to the police station and tell the police that it was actually Aaron who was the one who killed their father. Lainey is to stick with the story that she was being molested and Aaron found out and killed her husband to protect her daughter. Josie is to tell the cops that these memories just came back to her. And her lawyer lets the police know that this is a medical thing she had. She blocked so much out of it, but it recently came back. They both will also tell the police that Warren Cave had nothing to do with it. So he gets released. And Poppy is actually the one that picks up Warren from San Quentin and delivers him to his mother's place, where she is basically on death's door. I mean, she does not have a lot of time left, but Warren is able to have the final few hours with her where she is able to tell Warren, I love you. After Poppy dropped Warren off, she heads home and gets a visit from Marcus, who says to her, I heard you're heading back to New York City. And Poppy says, yeah, it kind of looks that way. And he says, well, it's probably for the best because I was coming over here to end this little work relationship that we had. Because working with Poppy has made him remember how much he loved Poppy and how much he still loves her. He realizes how many mistakes he made when they were younger, and he says that Ingram is a real stand-up guy, and he would never do anything to disrupt her current life. So, that's that. Poppy then goes upstairs and records the final episode of the podcast. Lainey and Josie, however, meet up at a diner, where Josie lets Lainey know that she's planning on staying for the time being. She then gets the real story from Lainey, asking her, Mom was going to tell everything to Poppy, right? And Lainey says, yeah, the pressure just got to her. And Josie asks her, well, that's why you gave her the pills, right? For me? And Lainey says, yeah, I mean, everything I do is for you. I love you more than you love me, remember? But the mood changes. Josie says, you're too sick, Lainey. Poppy was right. And she gets up and leaves. And that's because the police are walking in to arrest Lainey Berman for the murder of Aaron Berman. And that is how season one of Truth Be Told ends. Thank you so much for checking out this recap. Please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit thumbs up if you like this video. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought it sucked. But please be nice in the comments section. Too much negativity in the world. Nasty comments make me feel bad. Oh, and check out my podcast, Scene Invaders, for my thoughts on stuff.